has only been a, a few years, according to the text, from the time where the children of Israel have gone from really the freest people who have ever walked this earth. Maybe other than Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve only had one law to obey, uh, but the children of Israel have God as their ruler, their laws are contained in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, a very small law by which they have to live. They do have judges who are supposed to make uh, rulings according to those laws if somebody has transgressed them. But they have the ownership of their land that perpetuates from one generation to the next. They can do whatever they want to with it. They can build as much wealth as they like. They're free. But through that freedom, there's also the risk. And some people didn't use their freedom very positively. And they descended. The scripture says by the time we get to the time of the judges, everyone started doing what was right in their own eyes. And so they start bringing hurt and, and harm to one another. I think we can identify with that a little bit as a culture. I mean, America is certainly a, a free country, probably one of the freest ever. But we have certainly descended also into a time where everybody's just doing what they think is right, and it's bringing a lot of harm and chaos to everyone. Well, the children of Israel decided, we don't want God to be our ruler, we'll have our own king. And Samuel uh, has warned them, you don't want a king, it won't go well for you. And they said, no, no, we want a king, we want a king, please give us a king. And he gave them a king, the king they wanted, King Saul. Saul was not aware when he went out to look for the donkeys one day that he was going to end up becoming the king. He was a, a very much caught by surprise, I think. He has a lot of insecurities. If you remember in, in the story, the day of his coronation, uh, they make all these speeches and announcements about who the next king is going to be. And then they look around and they can't find him and he's hiding somewhere in the, in the luggage uh, from the people who had traveled there because he was afraid. And his insecurities uh, play heavily into some poor decision making. And by the time our story picks up today, he has made two egregious errors. One, he, he did not wait. Samuel said, I'll be there, I'll do the sacrifice. But Saul began to see his armies leaving, and, and he thought, if I do the sacrifice, the army will stay and we'll be okay. So he did the sacrifice instead of Samuel. He, he crossed the jurisdiction lines into the religious when he was only meant to be the political leader. And that was the first offense. And then the second offense came last week when he did not fully carry out God's command uh, to wipe out the nation of Amalek, and he kept some of the best things for himself. He said it was for a sacrifice, and Samuel gives him that, that great one-liner, to obey is better than sacrifice. You should have just been obedient, Saul. Because of that, God tells Samuel, I'm, I'm rejecting him, and I'm not going to have his, his, his line continue. And if you remember at the end of the story, Samuel turns to leave, and, and Saul reaches out to grab him, and he, he actually tears his coat, and and Saul, uh, Samuel says to Saul, so God has torn the kingdom away from you. And Samuel goes home, Saul goes home, and we pick up the story now in chapter 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? And this, this demonstrates some astonishing uh, character and compassion that Samuel has. Samuel didn't want Saul as king, he opposed it all the way, but once Saul became the king and became God's anointed to lead Israel. Samuel was all in, praying for him, helping him, advising him. And Samuel seems to be the most brokenhearted that Saul has been rejected. It's almost like Samuel wanted to make it work. The Lord says, how long will you mourn for him, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king from among his sons. Now, of course, this is an act of treason. We have a king, and you're sending me to go anoint the next king, and it's not his son, it's somebody else. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with, heifer with you and, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. 
and you shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So this man, Jesse, enters the story. And if you'll remember, early in my time in ministering with you, we went through the book of Ruth. And that's the first place that you hear the name of Jesse because his grandma is Ruth. And so this family is connected elsewhere in Scripture as well. So Samuel did what the Lord said, verse 4, he went to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? Because sometimes apparently Samuel went to a town to bring wrath and judgment and plagues and and they wanted to make sure that everything was okay. Do you come peaceably? And, And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was that when they came, that he looked at Eliab, and he said, Surely this is the Lord's anointed before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance, or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Don't you wish you had those kind of goggles, that you could put those on and see the heart and not see what's on the outside? God's looking at the heart. We do a lot of focus on the outside, don't we? But God's looking at the inside, and his opinion matters the most. And I'm glad you focused on the outside. You all look wonderful this morning. (laughs) And I'm going to believe that you look just as wonderful on the inside. God is looking at our hearts this morning. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Now hang on to those three who got rejected. They'll come back in the story later in another chapter. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before the Lord, or pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, well, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is feeding the sheep, probably from on a distant hillside. They can see, you know, he's way over there with the sheep. This might indicate that they're not an overly wealthy family. They didn't leave a servant. They actually left one of the children there to watch the sheep. And David doesn't even get invited to the sacrifice. He's got to pay his dues and watch the sheep and all the other brothers get to go. And apparently nobody had any uh, idea in the world that there was any reason for David to even show up. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. Now, you've probably had an occasion where you were here for a church dinner and somebody was waiting maybe for me or Tom Gamola to come down and pray. And we got talking to someone. And everybody's waiting for the dinner to start and and nobody has come to bless. And so you can imagine somebody says, hurry up and go get this kid. We want to eat. The the, the meat's getting cold. All right, so he sent and brought him in. And now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him. This is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Boy, what, a, what an interesting moment that might have been. I don't have older brothers. Who, who here has an older brother or, or a bunch of brothers? Anybody got a bunch of brothers? Yeah, I don't know how that, yeah, Bill, I can, or, or Gordon, I can imagine if, if you were getting the oil poured over your head and Bill was sitting there. <laughs> I, I, all I have is sisters, so I don't know how to relate to this, to this story. But I can imagine these brothers looking on like, oh, great. Now, what Bible story might be going through their heads? Oh, no. This is going to be another Joseph scenario. Because the youngest is the one that was chosen. Arise and anoint him, he's the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And notice this, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. This is very typical language in the Old Testament when a prophet or a deliverer, like a judge, think of Samson. 
And, and Samson's life was not a great life, but it says at times the spirit of the Lord would come upon him. He would kill a bunch of Philistines. Remember, he with the jawbone of a donkey or whatever. The spirit of the Lord would come upon people for a certain task that they had to do. So notice the spirit of the Lord has come upon David. Uh, from that day forward, he, it's enabling him to, to lead and to, to grow into the man that God wants him to be to lead this people. It's interesting, much later in David's life, after he has committed some terrible sins, and we'll, we'll get to those stories, David prays in the Psalms, the prayer is recorded, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He doesn't want to lead the people without having the spirits empowering to lead them. And there's a reason why, which is revealed in the next verse. So, this, so Samuel arose and went to Ramah, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now that's bad. Saul is left to have to figure it out on his own without the Spirit of the Lord. God has said to Saul, you have rejected me, I have rejected you. You don't want to obey me, you don't get my spirit anymore. And now notice what else happens. A distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. This is kind of like the story of Job, where God removes the shield. And he says to Saul, essentially, you have rejected me. Now the, the game is on. And, and this, this spirit, this troubling spirit, we would say a demonic spirit, has access to Saul now because of Saul's rejection of God's spirit, because of Saul's rejection of God's words. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. This is their, some of you like to listen to soothing music, you know. Maybe if you've had a stressful day at work, you have a particular radio station. And I like to listen to classical music. I'm one of those, like, every now and then just get in the car and I, I like it when a nice, soothing, I don't like it when it's a march or one of these really complicated songs. I want something nice and soothing if I've had a, a difficult day. And, and, and so this is an ancient thing where people would listen to music and it, they thought, well, this might help calm you down uh, with this distressing spirit. So his servants say, let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. Well, that's a nice sign of soothing instrument. And it shall be that when he will play with his hand, that when the distressing spirit of God is upon you, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of his servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. I don't know if uh, David was going to local festivals you know, with his uh, harp and a, a harp case sitting there for donations and was playing. Or, but apparently this servant of Saul had seen him play somewhere. I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. He's a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Now, do you remember the story of Esther? Because we went through the book of Esther here and how all of the time there are these what seem like unusually fortuitous circumstances where uh, the, the king is reading about Mordecai has saved his life and he's forgotten to help Mordecai. And at that moment, at that very moment, who walks in but Haman? And Haman's wanting to kill Mordecai. And all of the ways that God orchestrates the events of mankind uh, to, see, to get his will accomplished. And here, God is placing David in proximity to the throne years before he will ever become the king. Therefore, verse 19, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey and loaded it with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent uh, to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. In other words, he's more valuable to me and my army than he is to you out watching the sheep. Can you relieve him of his duties of watching sheep and let him be my armor bearer? Let him be in my immediate group of guards who stand with me. And so it was, whenever the Spirit of God was upon Saul, the Spirit from God uh, was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. And Saul would become refreshed as well. 
and the distressing spirit would depart from him. So it's very interesting. The spirit of God has left and departed Saul, but yet God has brought David, who has his spirit, in proximity. And it seems as when David walks in with the spirit of God that this distressing spirit has to leave as David enters and begins to play. Well, what are the takeaways from this text this morning? The first is this. If you, if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, I don't think it'll be on the screens. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 gives us uh, some exhortation just about uh, how to live the Christian life. And in verse 16, it, it says this. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do not quench the spirit. It's interesting. Uh, Saul is guilty of this quenching of the spirit. In other words, the spirit of God has been given to him to lead and guide the people. But what does he do? He pushes it away. He rejects it. And, and as Christians, we can be led or prompted by the Holy Spirit to do certain things. Some of you have had this happen where uh, you saw a particular person in need. And you, you just sensed an overwhelming sense of the Holy Spirit, I'm supposed to help this person. And it was different than other times, because there's other times you saw someone in need, and you, you didn't feel that same prompting. But there was a, a very specific, like, you could, like, the Lord didn't maybe say your name audibly, but you were like, I think I'm supposed to jump in and do something about this. That, that's a prompting of the Spirit. Other times the Spirit prompts us through His Word, uh, through the Word of God. So the Scripture says, you should be doing this. And we say, you know what, I, 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 feel, I sense the Spirit leading me through the Word that I'm supposed to take on this type of behavior. Or sometimes it's something that has to be removed from our life, where the Scripture says, you should put off uh, lying or, or false witness or, or some sin. And you say, you know what, uh, this is an area that I've got to put off, so I'm going to follow the Spirit's leading. And that's how we follow the Spirit's leading, how we... Quench the spirit as we say, nah, I know and it says this, I know I'm, I'm sensing this, but we, we push it aside. That's what Saul does. He knew the word of the Lord, what he was supposed to do with the Amalekites, but he had a different plan that he wanted to follow. He knew he was supposed to wait for Samuel, but he had a different plan he wanted to follow. And so in the New Testament, we are encouraged not to quench the spirit. So in that way, I think we can identify with Saul because probably every one of us has had moments in our life, whether through the word of God or the preaching of God's word or through even a, an internal sort of prompting of the spirit where we know that we are supposed to do or not do something. And that's a moment that we have. Are we going to quench the spirit or are we going to be obedient to God's spirit? So from Saul, we learn not to quench the spirit. What do we learn from David in this story? Commonly, when this text is preached, it's, it's to make everybody feel really good about themselves, and you're David, and, and you're overlooked, and you're just out there, you know, slinging rocks at the hillside, but there's a king inside of everyone, and, and I don't know, maybe there's a king or a queen inside of you, I, don't, I have no idea, I don't, probably none of us will ascend to the, the leadership of our nation. But there are some principles, I think, that we can learn from David. David is anointed king as a young man. But it will be many years of his life before he will take charge. And there are going to be multiple times that you're going to observe in his life as we go through this text where the opportunity is there. Two times in particular where he can finish Saul off. He can actually kill the king and ascend to the throne. And twice he resists that opportunity. From David, we learn that regardless who is above us, it is our job to serve humbly and faithfully. To do our duty as unto the Lord and not unto men. And to recognize that authority comes from God and to wait for God's timing. God is the one who establishes authority and God takes authority away. And David said, I'm not going to do anything against Saul. That's God's responsibility. God has put, placed Saul as the king. And when God's ready to take him out, then I'll become king. But I'm not going to be the one that does it. He's patient and he waits for God. He serves humbly and faithfully and recognizes authority comes from God. Lastly, I think we can identify and we can learn from the people of Israel. For they were the most free people who ever lived. Uh, but just like Adam and Eve, with all of that freedom, they made a foolish decision. And, and they chose sin. 
They could have had God rule over them, and, and, and they made a foolish decision, and then sin began. The, the scripture says sin rules over us. And you and I, the, the scripture says all have sinned. Every one of us has, uh, has sinned. We have all allowed something else to rule in our life, but God in his mercy has anointed Christ to be the ruler. And, and we can repent of sin and we can turn from it and we can turn to Christ and we can be restored to that relationship with God and say, all right, Lord, I, I, you're in charge of my life now. We, we call this the lordship of Christ. We focus heavily on Christ as our savior, but he's not just our savior. He is our savior and Lord, Jesus Christ the Lord. He's the one in charge. He's the new king in charge of our life. David is sort of a picture of that here, although David was very imperfect. But he's a picture of a Messiah who is yet to come, an anointed one. And so regardless of, of what you have chosen to rule over your life through sin, Jesus has now come. He's, he's paid the price for sin, and he is God's anointed to lead you into a life of freedom and liberty in obedience to God's laws. So I think we can learn from each of these characters in the story today. And lastly, we can say God looks at the heart. And so when, maybe when you wake up tomorrow morning and you're at the, at the mirror and you're, you're making yourself look great, maybe just a reminder is, all right, Lord, I look awesome. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done on the outside, Lord. This is amazing. But, Lord, I want to look good on the inside. And how do we, we have that interaction with God that says, you see the heart, you see, you see what I'm really like on the inside, and I want that to be pleasing to you most of all. Father, I pray that we would learn from this text, that we would learn from the characters in this story. Lord, I thank you so much that you have come as the new king and that you rule in a generous way. You rule in love not tyranny over us. And I thank you for that. And I pray that we would make our choices wisely and what we would allow to rule over us and that we would embrace what you have for us and that we would reject sin. Lord, I pray that we would wait patiently on your timing as David did, that we would recognize that all authority ultimately comes from you and you raise up kings and you put kings down in your time and that we can trust you for you are in charge of the affairs of men. We thank you uh, that you have given us your Holy Spirit, and I pray that we would not be guilty of quenching the Spirit, that we would follow your word, that we would follow the promptings of the Spirit, that we would be obedient, so that we might receive the blessing that comes from that obedience, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>